Hi everyone and welcome to our 12th week of our Families and Partnerships Unit. So this week is a big focus on the broad ideas. So the last couple of weeks we've been very focused on early intervention and how we support children at their point of need. Now let's go outward and we'll look at it from a more global perspective, particularly looking at the rights of the children and how we are their advocates for what's going on. So the things that we will look at today, we're going to look at a snapshot of children in WA taken from the last census. We're going to look at what's in place worldwide and how we then apply that in an educational setting. What's our role in wider society and a touch on the exploitation of children and how we can be advocates against that. So little snapshot. So we already know that children from First Nations are at a disadvantage a lot of times in our school environments, as are children from other vulnerable types of situations where they may have suffered abuse and so on. So we want to look at how they fit within our general population as well. So we know the numbers that we're dealing with and the absolutely imbalance that we have with our children who are suffering. So when we look at children, we have around 500,000 children in Western Australia out of our total population. They represent just under a third of our full population within Western Australia. So when we look at that and we start to break it down, we have around 30,000 who identify as First Nations, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and so on. We have them broken down into these. So approximately 20, I know that percentages don't quite add up, bug, bugs me each time. 23% a, approximately aged from birth to three years. So that's where we're looking at our children who may need time in childcare. We then have around 46 of our children who are in our primary school age. So that four to 11 years, which is where you will encounter them in a school-based setting. We have around 30% who are aged in our 12 to 17 years, which is sitting in our secondary settings. So that's not quite even is it you'll see that it doesn't even match up with age brackets and so on as well so we do have a steady growth of population in western australia so it's important for us to know that we will continue to get children coming through in our birth to three years and that we're going to have more and more need for people with your qualifications to make sure that we are able to support parents who need to put their children into care so that they can work, have respite and so on. So when we look at children who are experiencing issues, we have of those large proportion around 500,000 children, we've got 1,500 children who are currently displaced. So they cannot live at home. They may be homeless with their primary caregivers or they could be in foster care or some other assisted care facilities in some way. They usually can't live at home due to physical, sexual, emotional abuse, as well as potentially neglect within their own families. So those children are people that you will encounter in your schools and your schools will know what's going on. I find in a childcare setting that the communication is different. It's not worse, it's just different. They seem to have less communication down to the general people within your centre. So the people who are in charge, your centre leaders and so on, will know the issues that are going on and it's up to families to disclose them we're not obliged to be informed or anything like that. Whereas in a school situation, there is an obligation because they are enrolled at a state-run facility usually, and that means that we can then access records and so on. So it becomes a little bit easier to know what's going on. So when we're thinking about how we become an advocate for all those children who are experiencing difficulties, and I might like to add with that 1500, that only means the children who are removed from families or who are registered as being displaced, homeless and so on. That doesn't mean all the children who are going through issues that are not within the system in any way. 
So this is where we become their advocates. So the Children's Advocacy Report says that it's not about just providing representatives to speak on a child's behalf. It's making sure that we have the right systems to recognise the rights and needs of all children and to respond to them appropriately. We want to make sure that we are fulfilling that requirement from every different angle in some way. And we have a role to play in that advocacy. So you will be the voice for the children in your care. You're going to be assisting as part of that community. You need to make sure that the policies and systems, you know what they are and how you put them in place. So it means that we don't make excuses based on culture, race, language, economic status, family structure. We don't say, oh, they're from a really lovely family. We don't need to deal with this. Yes, we do. Because just because they're from something that outwardly looks like a lovely family doesn't mean that there is things going on that you are feeling and fairly sure are happening, but you dismiss because mum seems like a nice person. Dad seems like a nice person. We know that People don't wear a sign around their neck saying, I'm abusing my child. But the child tells us in every other way that something is going on in some way. So we are their advocates. So if we break it down, the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, fantastic. It's a universally agreed set of non-negotiable standards. So it means that it's not just Australia, it's not just the UK or the US, it's universally agreed. People under 18 years of age, they need care and protection that adults do not. We can be advocates for ourselves as an adult. A child cannot. So 192 countries have signed up to make that international law. So when we think about our rights of the child, let's go through them. So it's been used around the world to promote and protect our children's rights. It's been the impetus for advances in different countries recognising children's rights to survival, health, education and so on. Its four key principles are everything we do should be in the best interest of the child. We have a non-discrimination at the heart of everything. Every child has a right to survival and development, not just survival, and that we take into account children's views. So the rights at every of the child must lie at the heart of every program, every policy and every action. So this is how the Save the Children Fund in Australia takes the ideas of the United Nations. Those policies do not stand alone they are how we put it into practice. So it means that not just governments, but childcare centres, everyone must have children's rights at the centre and make sure that we are putting in place strategies so that those children are feeling really well supported. So I want you to have a think about it as we start talking about this. What do you truly believe are the most fundamental and universal rights of children? So what do we hold as our core? I think for me is that every child should feel safe at all times. And how do we put that into practice? I think for us as educators, it's such an important thing that we must do. So let's look at our conventions on the rights of the child and the core principles of them. So the best interests of the child. So what does this mean? So it means that when we are talking about courts, when we're talking about authorities, when we're talking about legislative bodies, when we're talking about public and private, everybody should have the best interests of the child at the core of every decision that they make. So when we're thinking about things like the child separating from its family, the child's upbringing and development, a child's involvement with the police and the judicial system, the child must have the best interests of the child at heart. Really, that should be at the core of it. So it's not taking into account the adults, it's looking at what is best for the child and will that group of adults be able to give them the best things possible? Is it going to be more harmful to take the child away than it is to leave the child there and support the adults in some way? Or is it better to remove the child or to give them access at certain points so that the 
primary caregivers and the biological parents are working together as a team. When we're talking about police and various other judicial systems and so on, that's why we don't prosecute children for crimes because we need to ascertain whether they understand the long-term ramifications of that. And that's why there's very few times that you will actually see children in Australia being prosecuted with crimes. You won't see 10 year olds being accused and tried and so on. You will see them being given support in different ways. Now, what we know is that sometimes the best interests of the child is actually going to come in conflict with the rights and responsibilities. And that's where children may need to be removed or caregivers may need to be supported in order to do the best for their child. So that's our first one. Our second one is non-discrimination. Now, this means no child ever should suffer discrimination due to race, colour, gender, language, religion, political or other opinions or other status. Every child should receive a quality of opportunity, not necessarily identical treatment. So a child who comes from a country that has been split by war and that child is a political refugee into this country, then they will receive additional funding and they should receive additional funding because they need support in order to adjust to the upheaval that they've gone through, to the emotional turmoil that they have witnessed, to the absolute destruction of their world as they know it. So they shouldn't receive identical treatment, they will receive different treatment. And we've talked a lot about this a number of weeks ago when we went into depth about equality versus equity and that those sorts of things, fair and equal, are not always the same thing. That sometimes you need to be unfair in your distribution of time and resources and money in order to create a quality between people because they're coming from different circumstances. So that's what discrimination gets to. It's not saying that everyone receives the same treatment. It's saying that people have the equality of treatment so that they will then be able to achieve to the same degree. And that's important with discrimination. It's not saying we treat everybody exactly the same. It's they shouldn't suffer discrimination in any way. Our third one is that every child has a right to life survival and development, not just a right to survive, but we should have access for every child to appropriate health, physical development, mental development, spiritual development, moral development and social development through school, through various support mechanisms, through access to other services and so on. We know that in a lot of countries around the world that is not being met. So we look at Ukraine at the moment. We look at girls in a few countries around the world where the Taliban has banned education and so on. We can see that not every child has a right to life, survival and development. Our fourth one is that we look at the views of the child. So children should be able to express themselves. They should have an opinion in the matters that affect them and they should be given due weight, obviously, according to the age of maturity, maturity of the child. We've all negotiated with the two-year-olds who have the negotiation skills of sophisticated um, hostage negotiators and they will negotiate everything under the sun that's not taking that into account. We need to make sure that we are listening to children and taking into account their opinions and views. So we have our United Nations and then in Australia, we have a couple of different organisations that take this in different ways. So Caritas Australia, they look at this through a couple of different lenses. So they say every child has the right to equality, Every child has a right to a name and nationality. Now, I know that sounds, well, simplistic, but if you are a displaced person, you do not have a birth certificate, you are going by what you are told, your name is not written formally somewhere, 
and we have a number of First Nations people and people from who are displaced from their original countries of origin who are unable to access bank accounts because they don't have the right identification in order to open a bank account. So therefore, will have difficulty receiving government payments, will have difficulty establishing a rent history, even though, you know, it all goes together. So that idea of a name and a nationality, I know it sounds silly, but it's really important. Every child should have a right to adequate housing, nutrition and medical services. Every child should have a right to education, be protected from work and anything that would stop them from going to school. Now, we do have child labour that is happening even in Australia. It's not rife in Australia, but it is certainly part of our way that we need to look out for what's happening with some children. Every child should have a right to rest and play, not moving straight from school to school to school in some way, which unfortunately we do have. Every child has a right to love, understanding and protection and every child has a right to special care and treatment if they have any issues that need extra support in some way. We also have every child should be protected against all forms of neglect, cruelty and abuse, have all the help needed to recover from those, enjoy their own culture, religion and language. I really like that phrasing, to enjoy it, not be burdened by it, not be embarrassed by it and so on. They should be protected in times of war and conflict. Be among the first to receive aid and relief. Seek refugee status and receive appropriate protection and assistance. Make sure that they have freedom. So no child should be imprisoned unlawfully. So this is where things like mothers who are incarcerated when they are pregnant and they give birth their child can stay with them for a certain period of time, but then their child must experience freedom. And that's where what is best for the child versus what is best for the mother become two separate things. So that's the idea that the child shouldn't be imprisoned because the mother is imprisoned. So yes, we go, oh, but the mother should have their child, but should the child be imprisoned at the same time? So that's where we need to take into account so many different variables. So in summary, every child should have the right to well-being and a life of dignity and all children have the rights to all of those things. They have the right to not be discriminated against. They have the right to education, privacy, protection, rest, leisure, play, adequate standards of living, freedom from exploitation and participation, including the right to be heard. Now, as educators, and I think almost just as human beings, every single one of us, we have a role to play in making sure that every child enjoys an actual childhood. So remember that childhood uh, is a social construct. So we need to keep that social construct in our current existence. So it means that we don't make children grow up way too early. We don't give them unnecessary responsibilities. We don't send them out to work at eight years of age and that work is remunerated and great for the family, but we don't send a child out to work in any way. So as teachers, we play a significant role because we are the people who see the children. We see the children in our care all the time. We make sure that we are watching, listening, observing, taking note of different things. We are the advocate for the children who are in our care. So how does that apply in an educational setting? So let's think about this from those four points of view. So when we look at the best interests of the child, so that means that we're not doing what's convenient for us as adults or as the educator. We're looking at what is best for the child. So things like all day kindy. There was a massive, massive backlash when kindy started with half days. So that was done with the best interests of the child that a lot of schools said, well, actually for three and four year olds, coming to kindy for just half a day and then going home or to care for the other half of the day, that's in the best interest of the child. So we were looking at it from who does it serve? It serves a, 
rights of the child. However, sometimes as society's moved on and we now have more children who are going into childcare and we have longer childcare, we're realizing that children are able to cope with kindy. And yeah, it's probably ideal that we could just have half a day, but that's where kindy is not considered compulsory schooling. So if parents only want to bring them for half a day because their child gets too exhausted, they can pick them up at lunchtime and take them home. It's not counted as truancy or anything like that that needs intervention from any of our higher organisations in any way. So we've got what is best for the child. It might be just a few hours, but making sure that then it is also convenient for parents is the balance that sometimes we have to go with. So we always want to have the best interests of the child at heart. So this idea of non-discrimination. So providing fairness rather than exactly the same for everyone. So things like technology is one that I often see in schools because of the role that I have. So schools that implement a one-to-one -one program for children, the school just when you're talking with leadership, they will all talk about how we will make sure no child is left behind and that if their parents can't afford to pay for it, the school will support it. So simple things like that, we make sure that we are providing equity and equality. So making sure that we're doing the right for every child. Now developing our whole child. So making sure that we have the right to survival, life and development. So lots of children have the right to survival. Absolutely, we put in place things to make that happen. But this idea of development is really important. And we take the development from the broader perspectives of spiritual development, moral development, intellectual development, social development, physical development, and of course our emotional development. So we as educators, we provide for all of those. So we're making sure that we are not running schools just for the cognitive and intellectual development of the child. We're looking at in our early years, all of those aspects. We're making sure that we don't just focus on the social development, that we do focus on our spiritual and moral development as well. So we're making sure that we have the broad range. And looking at the views of the child, our early years learning framework talks a lot about agency, empowering children, having children talk and give their opinions on things, creating an environment where you are not the adult railroading the child into every decision, but you are actually creating that beautiful, warm listening environment where you're saying, oh, so which would which are the things that we would like to do? We have to do these sorts of things because that's what we have to do today. But what are your choices? What would we like to do? And using empowering language that the child feels that they have choices in their development and that they can speak openly about things. They're not hidden off to the side and told, no, no, this is what our class is doing and this is what the teacher wants you to do. But you're actually creating that environment involvement of the children and where possible we have our education stemming from the child in some way. So Nate Nelson Mandela, beautiful, beautiful, amazing thinker. A society that has a soul is one that nurtures its children. A society that is good for children is good for everyone. There's two areas of need that we have in our broader community. One is to make sure that we take care of children and the other is to make sure that we take care of our elderly. So a society that is able to put in place beautiful processes for each of those is a society that will grow and flourish. A society that ignores its elderly or treats its young children with disdain and disrespect is not going to create a beautiful set of adults because it will create a very self-centered, soulless community. If we make sure that we nurture all our little people and we make sure that we are nurturing and protecting and providing for our elderly and our other vulnerable areas in our community, it means that our entire society will flourish a lot more. So if we think a core question for us as educators in a contemporary world. 
using our collective knowledge about what we know is good for children, what qualities would a society have that puts children at the centre? And we'll have a chat about this in our tutorial coming up. So how do we make sure that children are in the middle and it's not 100% just adult focused in our world? So in our wider society, we want to make sure that we have equality, trust, collective gains. We value and support parenting. We don't bash parents up all the time. We value childhood, actually childhood, rather than just childhood being seen as the progression to adulthood. We look at prevention. So that's why we have such a focus on early intervention. We're caring for our natural environment because we know that will impact on our children's future. We're making sure that we provide nice, safe environments, physical and emotional. We're pre creating the right, in, the right environment to balance technologies. And we're making sure that we really care for all the children that we come into contact with. So if we think about this from the idea of now moving to a more negative perspective, why is it important that we maintain and advocate for children's rights? When I went searching for young children working and finding various images, it's a little bit disturbing, the types of images that you find from the turn of last century. And children's rights were not put in place until what I would consider relatively recently. So only in the last less than 100 years, have we had the actual advocation for children to have a childhood? Because remember, childhood is a social construct. So only the children of the wealthy had a childhood. The children of the middle and lower class, they didn't have a childhood. They had minimal education and then they were put to work. So we need to think about what is our exploitation of children? The first one that we would be very aware of because we have mandatory reporting. We have simple things like a working with children card. We have a crim check. So we are avoiding the sexual exploitation of children when we have them in, in our care. But we should also be noticing anything that would give us alarm bells for anything else that's going on. We also need to be really aware, because it is still happening all the way around the world, of economic exploitation, where small children are being used to work, often unpaid, and they are being used for cheap labour in different ways. Now, we say, oh, but there's rules against that in Australia. Yes, there are rules against it. However, how many times do you go into various places that might be small family run businesses and we see children in there? Now, we go, oh yeah, they're just in there after school and so on. But are they? What is the rights and the obligations that that family is placing on those children to work? In different ways. So we need to be really aware of the economic exploitation that is still happening in different places, even within Australia. We know it's happening around the world and every organisation now needs to have a modern slavery act so that we understand what is going on around the world and we want to be able to look for certain things when we are buying goods and services to make sure that we are not helping to perpetuate the economic exploitation of children. And we need to be aware of other forms of exploitation that we may have as well. So when we think about the exploitation of children, we are the observers and we are the recorders of things when we are in education. So we note down things that we are worried about and we talk to other people about it. We don't brush things under the carpet. We don't give excuses. We seek information and then we put it up the chain if we need to in some way no longer do we go oh yeah we'll, we'll just leave that for a little while no we start to note it down and we talk to people about it what are our obstacles so we have oftentimes the best intentions in the world but governments need to make sure that policies are put in place because sometimes we can't do anything about it 
in different ways. We might notice, we might state, but we don't know what to do about it. Oftentimes, children have no one to talk to. So children need to be able to voice their opinions. And the voicing of their opinions is often to a trusted educator when they are young. That's why we need to be their voice in different ways. And culture, uh, culture is an interesting one. It can be better or worse for them. So the laws on children's rights, they're, they're universal. So United Nations. But many countries have argued that the need for them to be interpreted in relation to their culture. So culture can often be used as an excuse to defend policies and practices that potentially degrade children. For example, we have forced marriages in lots of countries. Those are children that are being forced into marriage. So essentially using marriage as the catch-all doesn't excuse an underage girl being forced into sexual activity of some sort. So making sure that we are active advocates, not just in our own country, but for other things happening. Or when those cultural practices are tried and used in this country, we have the appropriate, going back to the first one, we have the appropriate policies put in place to stop that happening. That we do not have various things going on under the guise of that's our culture, that's what we do. No, no, it shouldn't happen. It's not fitting with the rights of the children. So for those of you who are also very passionate about this, if you want to find some more information, United Nations, uh, the Devon Children's Rights, our HSPC and Early Childhood Australia, there's some beautiful words in Early Childhood Australia about how we as a professional should be promoting advocacy for us and for the children that we have in our care. So in summary, our wider community has an impact on the lives of the children. So looking at Bronfenbrenner, children have rights. United Nations and Caritas Australia, our clear rights of the children non-discrimination, best interests of the child, views of the child, the right to life, development, survival, all of those are their rights. We need to look after children. They are our adults of tomorrow. So we need to make sure that our society is going to be rich and value diversity and so on. And as teachers and educators, we are the advocators of children's rights with the children that we have in our care. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Absolutely. So that is why nations stop certain children from being educated throughout their lives. And that is why our developed nations have compulsory schooling because we know education is so important. So our tutorial this week, we are looking at some ideas for some practical strategies for child advocacy. We've got our presentations and we're going to have some conversations about preparing for your final placement. So looking forward to seeing you all in class, either in our face-to-face -face or in our online one. I will see you all on Tuesday. Thanks, everyone.